we are studying these, uh, these epistles. We began in Galatians uh, when we started the epistle study. And uh, we, um, we went to Ephesians and Philippians, and there are four of these prison epistles. Uh, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, the church in Philippi, this one, the church in Colossae, and um, the fourth one is a very personal one to one man, to Philemon, who's also in Colossae, by the way. Um, but uh, it's a very personal letter. It's a whole different type of a letter altogether. This is, to me, this is a fascinating study. I, I find this to be one of my favorite epistles, and it deals with pretty much everything that we deal with as Christians in the world that we're living in today. Um, you can divide it out. There's four chapters in many ways. You could outline it uh, if you wanted to, is chapter one being about the Christ and who he is, and um, the, is chapter two about the cults. And we'll talk about that in a minute because it's very appropriate for us today. And then the church chapters three and four and, and what the practice of the church is and should be and that sort of thing. This, is, this was written, again, because it's a prison epistle. It was written somewhere in the realm, a range of about 62, 63 AD. Now, you know, we use those terms sometimes and that kind of just goes right past us. Just to kind of get some perspective, Paul was a contemporary of Jesus, probably about the same age as Jesus. So that um, when, when Jesus was crucified, resurrected, rose again at, you know, in the midpoint of his 34th year, Paul was about the same age. So if that's 32 AD when that happens and now we're in 62 AD, we're talking about a man who has um, been an apostle for easily the last 25 years. Um, has gone through all kinds of turmoil in his life, has, has been beaten, has suffered deprivation, starvation. Um, when I say beaten, all kinds of beatings. Uh, beatings with whips, beating with rods. He's been in prison many times. He's been shipwrecked many times, all these things. Uh, this guy has the scars uh, to prove it. Now he's in prison in Rome, and, uh, and he's, he's in his 60s. So to be in your 60s now and to be in your 60s in the first century are different from one another. This guy w was probably pretty hurt and pop in a lot of ways. Um, and yet the, the brilliance of Paul never ceases to astound me, the kinds of things that, that he has to say. He's going to be dealing with an issue in Colossae. Actually, let's back up for a second. The church in Colossae uh, is, if we think of you know, the Asia Minor or Western Turkey, um, there are seven churches there, seven cities, I mean there's more than that, but um, there were the seven that Jesus dictated the letters to, Ephesus being one of them. And um, Colossae would have been within 100 miles of Ephesus. It was actually within about 10 miles of Laodicea. So you have uh, Colossae, Hierapolis, and uh, Laodicea all within about a 10 mile range. So basically, I guess you'd say from you know, Newtown, Doylestown, Chalfont type of a, a range, if you kind of look at it that way. Um, and I think it's not coincidental that within 30 years of this, or less than that, um, Jesus is going to dictate a letter to the church in Laodicea, saying, I know your works, I know that you are neither cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spew, I always like that, spew you or vomit you, that's what it means. I'm, I'm ready to puke, is what he says. I'm ready to vomit you out of my mouth. What on earth would cause the Son of God to want to say something like that to the church in Laodicea? 
you make me want to puke. You know, that's the kind of thing that, you, that's not, for some people that's fighting words today. If you said that to somebody, here's God himself saying that to a church in Laodicea saying, you make me want to puke. And he's talking about what, you know, just to sum it up, because it's not all about Laodicea in that letter, but um, it, it was the lukewarmness. He says, he goes on to say, you say, because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're wretched, and you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. White garments so that you may be clothed, so that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, that you anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke, and I chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Wow, what, why does he say that? And of course you're asking, and what on earth does that have to do with a study in the book of Colossians? Well, because they were right nearby. And, and the, the, the starting up of the church in Colossae was by principally a man named Epaphras who comes, who actually lives in Colossae, has family there, but he was a disciple of Paul and probably spent about three years with him in Ephesus and comes back, brings the gospel there. The gospel goes forth in Colossae. The church begins to grow. We're going to see how there is this uh, great heresy that has come into the church. And it wasn't just a local, temporary issue. It's an issue that's been going on ever since. Well, before that, actually, but it's certainly been going on, <clears throat> excuse me, ever since. It faces the church today in many forms, and we're not going to go into all that tonight, but we'll do it one night because I think it's important for us to understand. Because if I use words like Gnosticism, some people might hear, here might know what Gnosticism is, but for the most part, it's sort of, you know, a, an odd, arcane kind of a, a term, and it doesn't mean much. Uh, but, but it has infiltrated so much of the modern church, the Western church, and particularly here in America. Uh, it's very much a pop idea. It's very much uh, intertwined with Eastern religions and, and Eastern ideas and asceticism and a number of things. Um, it was affecting the church. Now, Paul's addressing it here in Colossae, but it would seem that it also had affected then Hierapolis and Laodicea. And so, so now 30 years after this, or within 30 years after writing this letter, here's Jesus dictating a letter to the church in Laodicea saying, you think you're all that, you think you've got it all together, you think you know, you're, you're rich and you have need of nothing else, but you don't realize that you're poor, you're wretched, you're blind and you're naked. Because you're living in your sin and you're living boldly in your sin. And you think, who cares? I'm, I'm living the way I want to and that's all that matters. And there, there, I'm sure there's none of us in here who can relate to that. Okay? But, but, but he says, you don't realize the danger that you're in. That's why you know, we come to the famous verse, verse 20 of chapter 3 of Revelation. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. Jesus outside the door, of the, outside the church. He's not calling to what we would call, you know, even though we use it in an invitation for people to come to Christ. He's talking to a church. He's saying, I want to be there. I love you. Those I, I love, I chasten. So I'm chastening you. But I'm telling you, I want to I be there. And so it's, to me, it's important that we understand that, how close by they were. Because to us, 10 miles away, within 10 miles, if we go from from New Hope or Buckingham out to Chalfont or Montgomeryville, just along 202, how many churches, you know, what we call churches, buildings, are we going to count? But you're not looking at that in, in the first century. You're looking at centers, you know, a, a, a city, small or large, and Colossae probably wasn't a very large one, um, and, and there were home churches, and there, were, there would be, a, you know, someone who was sort of the pastor over the pastors in that area, but uh, you had this major problem that had affected Colossae and had affected Hierapolis and had affected Laodicea. And so Paul here is addressing this. So he, he writes um, for a number of reasons, but it appears that the, the occasion for his writing was because of what he's heard about the health of the church and his great concern for the cancer that has come in. 
this philosophical cancer that has come into the church, and, and, and he tries to straighten a lot of that out. Uh, so he, he deals with this Gnostic heresy, and once again, this heresy of Gnosticism, and before we're done, I'll explain what it, a little bit about what it's all about. It is more dangerous to the church of Jesus Christ today than Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or Islam. As much as we point our finger at Islam, the danger is always one who comes in looking just like the Christian. And that's what, 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 hap what happened in Colossae. That's what happens so much in the church today. It's the, the people who come in saying, well, that's, that's great that you study the Bible. That's great that you go to that church. It's great that you worship. It's great that, that he teaches verse by verse and all those things. But you know there's more. There's other stuff that you need to know. They're the, they're, the, they're the people, the deeper people, right? They're the people with the secret knowledge or the super knowledge, right? They, they know more and, and they, they say, come, up, you know, come to my house and I'll explain more of that to you. Um, and, and so it's, it's important that we see that the, there's a real application for us too. You know, does, uh, does our diet, you know, the food that we eat, does it affect our spiritual lives? Really? Do, do the, the, does the position of the stars affect your personality when you're born? Now we all know that's supposed to be a no answer. Okay. <laughs> you tripped me up on the first one, John, but I, I know the second one's supposed to be a no. But really, do the planets influence our, our lives? Um, do Eastern religions have something for us as Christians that we can learn from? You know, does God speak to our minds? Or does he speak to us primarily through his word? These become very important questions that most of us kind of slip over. We don't, we don't think about the importance of the question until we have to deal with the importance of the question. But these are very important questions. And these were questions that were very very important questions in the first century, in, you know, in the 60s of the first century, as they are today. Because Christians were bombarded with them in Colossae and other places. Um, John writes about Gnosticism in, his, in, in all three of his epistles. He deals with this issue. And here's Paul dealing with it here. So it was a major issue then, but it's also a major, here, major issue here in um, in our day and age. All right, so before we go further, let's understand a little bit about what Gnosticism is. Don't worry, we're gonna study the first chapter tonight, or most of it, but I, I want us to understand a little bit about it. Uh, Gnosticism comes from a Greek word, gnosis, or gnosos, okay, which is the Greek word for knowledge, or to know something. Um, so to know something uh, is, is gnosis, or, or, or we'll just leave it at that, gnosis. Uh, we're familiar with the word agnostic. Um, I forget who it was that coined that term, but anyhow, agnostic. So you put the A on, in front of it, A means without. So agnostic says, I'm without knowledge, right? I don't know if there's a God. An agnostic would say, I don't know if there's a God. Um, and it's just the Greek, it's taking the Greek word gnosis and putting the A in front of it. And you've probably heard before that the Latin for equivalent of that would be ignoramus. Okay, that's what that is. So, which is always fun, you know, and when you're at a party and someone says, I'm an agnostic, you know, and you say, well, actually, you'd be interested to know what the Latin for that is. Because um, no one really wants to say with that level of arrogance, you know, I'm an ignoramus. Um, they probably ought to, but. So, basically, um, Gnosticism is the idea of the people who pursued the greater knowledge. Actually, sometimes you would find in the Greek, um, in, uh, in that day, in the epistles, epignosis, epi, the E-P-I, like super is what that, E-P-I means super, super or superior knowledge. And that's typically the case, you know, very often you'll find where someone comes to you and they, they, they believe that they have superior knowledge about who God is and how to relate to God. Yes, this is great that, that, um, that you believe that Jesus is the Christ. It's great that, that you have the Bible to study. That's wonderful. 
But did you know? And that's where it starts from there, okay? And, and now we get into these other things. And, and the closer it is to the truth, but not quite the truth, the harder it is to gauge. And that's why it's important for us. You know, Paul will tell Timothy to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman uh, who needeth not to be ashamed, who can rightly divide the word of truth. He's not just talking to a pastor or a pastor of pastors. That's for every single one of us. We each have a responsibility to study the word of God so that we can rightly divide the word of truth so that we can smell an error when it comes. Uh, we've all heard this before, no doubt, but you know, the way that you, that, that you determine what a counterfeit is is by studying the real thing. And, and that's the way it works with, with the scripture. The more we study the truth, the word of God, there is no other revelation from God except the Bible. That's it. There is no other. And so it doesn't matter what quote unquote holy book or how much someone has studied something. Nobody, no matter how hard anybody has ever studied, nobody can surpass what's written in the word of God because this book, this alone, is the full revelation of God given to man that we may know how we may be saved and how God wants to, um, uh, to, to bring man from a state of darkness to a state of light, from a state of being lost to a state of being saved, that we can be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. It's only in the Bible. People can write about it, but the truth of it and the full revelation of it is only in the Bible. Okay, so, so this idea of Gnosticism. So there were a couple of different divisions, and I'll just keep it at two, because you can actually get into three or four, but there were two basic ideas. One was that you know, yet, and well, they, they both divided that which is spirit and that which is matter. Okay? And, and the idea is that that which is spirit is good, and that which is matter is evil. Now, the Bible never says that which is matter is evil, but a lot of people just go along with that. They, they start to believe that, but that's not, it's, it's what the matter does that determines what's evil and what's not, okay? But anyhow, so that which is good, the spirit is good, and that which is matter is evil, they believed. And so, um, I mean, some would even say, some of them would even say that Jesus was not uh, a man. He was never really in the flesh. He was actually a phantom, you know, like he didn't leave footprints. So, you know, you have to take the plaque down from the wall and all that stuff. Um, it, because he was a phantom. He, he only appeared, but, but you didn't really see him. Um, and... Uh, and, and others would say, well, actually, he could transform back and forth so that when he went to the cross, um, the, uh, the, the spirit part of him went away, and it was only the man, Jesus, who was crucified there. There's all kinds of permutations from this. But anyhow, so, so the basic division is there's that which is, that which is spirit is good, that which is matter is not. And so one side of Gnosticism says you have to avoid as much as possible doing anything that will ever please that which is matter in you, the flesh. You have to avoid, you have to live an ascetic lifestyle, um, deprive yourself. They, many of them gave themselves to flagellation and all sorts of things in order to um, harm themselves so that they didn't love that which is matter. Um, in order to, to please God by, by moving toward their spirit side. Another side of Gnosticism, which is, it sounds absolutely goofy, but this is exactly what they believe, said, no, 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 you're, you're part right. There is that which is spirit, and there's that which is matter. And that, that which is spirit is good, and that which is matter is evil. But we can't help the fact that we're made of matter. So it's all going to work out anyhow. So just fulfill every appetite you have. Go ahead. It's already evil. It's already condemned. So you may as well. I mean, those are about as diametrically opposed as you can get, but they were both called Gnostics, okay? Now, it was this, it was this combination of, or this dog's dinner of philosophy that was in the church. And like I say, some other time we'll deal with it, how it affects the church today, but it affects the church in many ways. So, but it was greatly affecting the church there. And so some, the, you know, the ones who wanted to... Um, deprive the flesh, 
they went, they had a tendency to bring in a lot of Jewish, even though this was principally a Gentile church, uh, they brought a lot of Jewish legalism into things, and Paul will deal with that when you get into chapter two. He'll deal with both sides, but he'll deal with the legalistic side when you get to chapter two. Um, and, and of course, then those who, um, who wanted to satisfy the flesh, because who cares, they just went ahead and um, did whatever they want to, and Paul's gonna address that as well. So that's the background, and that's the occasion for the letter as we get into it. Starts off like all of Paul's epistles, um, but there's no reason to skip over it. He says, Paul, it's a, remember this is a scroll that's being sent. He didn't type a letter and um, put it into an envelope with a stamp and send it to somebody. That's the way we get a letter today. You get a letter, it has your address on front of it. You know that it's sent to you. Uh, it has a return address. You know who it's from. That's why when you read the letter today, it, the, you know, the, 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 who it's from is down at the bottom of the letter because you already know who it's from. Uh, and so you just, you just go ahead and read and it signs, you know, sincerely, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in those days, you didn't do that because you had a scroll. You were unrolling it. So you started right at the top with who it's from, Paul. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, just so that there's no misunderstanding an apostle. He's an apostle by the will of God, not by his will, not by any other person's will, and this is consistent with his other writings, but you know, Paul's making it clear there's authority here. Um, he says, and Timothy, our brother, there's no evidence that Timothy um, was, a, was part, was an author in this, okay, but rather Timothy was with Paul, and he was probably the, uh, the writer. I mean, Paul's the author, but Timothy probably was the amanuensis on it. Um, two, so the saints, the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, to the saints. That, he's, not, he's not differentiating saints from faithful brothers. He's saying anybody who's saved is a saint, right? And this has nothing to do with you know, Roman Catholicism or plastic saints on dashboards or anything like that, okay? Anybody who knows Christ as their savior is a saint. Uh, and there are some who are particularly faithful. There are some who are not that faithful in their walk and there are those who are faithful in their walk. He says, to the saints and the faithful brothers who are in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a salutation. We give thanks to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. Okay, let's, we'll take a breath, for at least for a minute, because Paul is, I mean, think about this. I mean, what I appreciate a lot about this epistle, besides the, the fact that he's dealing with you know, philosophical issues that we also face today, Paul had nothing to do directly with, with this church. He wasn't responsible for starting it. He didn't go there. Um, he was 100 miles away in Ephesus. But a man from Colossae, Epaphras, was there in Ephesus. And he learned from Paul, and he saw the power of God as, as, as the gospel transformed so many lives. Jesus Christ transformed the lives of people living in Ephesus, the saints in Ephesus. Um, and he went and, uh, back to his home, to his, presumably to his family and others, and he brought the gospel there, and people were saved. So now uh, Epaphras has gone to find Paul to tell him about the problem that's going on in Colossae, but he's also telling him about the good things that are happening. I love the fact that you know, here's, here's a man who takes off and, and from, from Ephesus and goes to Colossae. Now, he, he could have gone anywhere, but he goes to his hometown. He goes back to his own and he brings the gospel there and he says, this is the truth and people's lives are transformed. And you know, we don't have any indication, we don't today, of how many people lived in the city and how many people were believers in that city, but, but the evidence of 
change in people's lives and, and in the church at, um, uh, in Colossae has reached Paul and, and that it was now affecting other people. Go look at it. I mean, it affects uh, down the road, down to Hierapolis and to Laodicea. People are getting saved, so not just in a little area. And, and, and one of the things that, that really strikes me as I read through this and I think about this man, Epaphras, he's just a guy. We, we put so much emphasis in the church today, and I, I almost feel funny saying this sometimes because I know I went to seminary, I, but, but my zeal for Jesus Christ didn't happen in a seminary. In like fact, it almost worked the reverse of that for a while. Um, but... but God uses regular men and women. Regular men and women, just like those of us who are sitting in this room right now. He uses regular men and women who are struck by the gospel, whose lives are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, who are not content to simply do the same old, same old, but, but then want, but realize my life is no longer my own. I've been bought with the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not who I used to be. I'm saved. My sins are paid for. The blood of Christ has washed me clean. I have the spirit of God in me, and God wants to use me. What can I do? I mean, good grief. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's almost as if we, we, we stand in the pulpit and say, well, we need help. You know, we, we need people to help in the parking lot or to help out as ushers or in children's ministry. I'm not pitching it. I'm just giving that as an example. And, and, and there's this feeling that you can get sometimes when you're the one who's saying that. Like people are just like, okay, just hurry up and then shut up and then get on with, you know, because I didn't come for that. I came, to, I came to get fed more. Well, there's no sense in getting fed if we're not going to use what, if we're not going to use the nutrition that God's giving to us. There's no sense in eating. If, if that's the case, we're just going to sit and get fat, like me. So, so the, the point is, it's regular people who go out and do this. We have this idea so much in, in our society. We have this idea of, of professionalism. We actually use words like, I hate the word, but the clergy. Well, that says that there's, there's this class of people and then there's everybody else. We call it clergy and laity. That's, there's a sickness in that kind of a language to say that there's those of us here and then there's everybody else. You know, and they just sort of follow along and do whatever they're told. And that's not the body of Christ. That's not the, what we're called to be. Think of it, every last one of us in this room who knows Christ is our savior, we came to a point in our life where we were transformed by the truth Jesus Christ changed our lives when we received the gospel, we heard the gospel, we got it. It might have been the fifth time, it might have been the 25th time, I think for me it was probably the 65th time that I probably heard it, but I got it, and I said yes to it. And suddenly I was no longer offended, suddenly I was no longer bored by this. Suddenly I came alive, because at that point the old John died. The old John, in a sense, died in that, in that I didn't want to live that old John anymore. I wanted to live what, what God wanted to do in me. I, I appreciated the fact that the price of my sins, the, the, you know, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll generation that I had been a part of, was paid for. It was paid for. It was paid in full. And I could move on white. And I could, I, and I could, I, I could bear the righteousness of Jesus Christ in me, not my righteousness, but his, because his spirit was in me. He'd washed me clean and his spirit was in me. And I wanted to do things. It wasn't because of any training that I had, because I didn't have any. But I loved Jesus Christ, and, and that happened in all of our lives at some point. Something happened. And of course, then something else happens in our lives. We mature. That's a dangerous thing to mature. No, it's a good thing to mature. But what I'm saying is, the danger is that, you know, you look at a banana, watch it mature. It just gets soft and brown and you throw it away, right? That's mature fruit. It's, 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 it's 
it's like a, a, when the apple gets all mealy and you bite into it, and you go, was that a worm or was that the apple that I just ate, right? Well, we don't want to be those kinds of Christians. We want to be fresh fruit. We want to be used by God. And what happens is, we'll get back to Colossians, but what happens is, <laughs> really, think of it. What happens is we get told Sometimes we get told by friends, sometimes we get told by family, sometimes we get told by the church at large, sometimes it's basically just us telling ourselves, and the devil's happy to help us to believe this. You got nothing to offer. Who are you? Who do you think you are? What, are you going to bring something new to this? This has been going on for thousands of years. Much brighter people than you have been down this road. What have you got to offer? Nothing. That's what we've got to offer. Nothing except a blood-bought child of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, gifted by God with the, with, with the gifts of God. That's what we have to offer, availability. That's what we have to offer. And that's who Epaphras was. He was just a guy, but he was radically transformed like we all were, it's a question of how much we allow that to happen in our lives. He was radically transformed, and so he went home with the good news. And a church starts in Colossae. God wants to do that in our lives. Sometimes we get burnt out. I understand. Sometimes we get bruised along the way. Boy, I understand that. I really do. And, and if we were to, to do testimony time There'd be a lot of stories from a lot of people in here about the bumps and bruises and wounds that maybe we've received. And, and too often, it comes from other believers. It's really sad. And I don't mean to demean that feeling by what I'm about to say. But there comes a point where we have to stand up on our hind legs and put that behind us and walk forward into what God has for us. Otherwise, we're just going to end up Dying, going to heaven, sucking our thumbs, saying, I'm just so glad I'm here. When, when, when the reality is, he has more for us right now. And if you're stuck in immorality, if you're stuck in compromise, get out of it. Just get out of it. Choose today whom you will serve. You're either going to serve the, the same gods that you served before you came to Christ, or you're going to come to Christ and you're going to follow him. So Epaphras was a man who came to Christ, and he chose he was going to follow him, and, and, and he did exactly what Jesus told the apostles to do. Go into all the world, make disciples, preach the good news, baptize them, teach them the word of God, teach them to obey the things I've done. That's what he went and did. He was no one special. He didn't go to seminary. He just did it. And that's what so many of us can say is our background. We just said, okay, I don't know what else to do, so I'll do this. And, and, and that's what happened. That's what God wants to do with your life. He really does. That's what he wants to do with your life. And that's what he did with the life of Epaphras. And that's why we have the church in Colossae. Okay, now there's problems that come in, but look what Paul is saying before the problems. He says, we thank God. Timothy and I are sitting here, and we are thanking God the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we are praying always for you. Wouldn't you like to know that? I mean, I know there are people who will tell me from time to time, you know, I pray for you and your family every day. Thank you. If you pray for us, we really, really appreciate it. We, you know, it's, it's, it's great to know when someone says that, but just to know that there are people who are praying. That's powerful. We all need prayer. And, 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 and if you're doing it, Please continue. If you've thought of doing it, choose to decide or choose to do it and do it, okay? But um, he says, we pray always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. It's kind of interesting. Do you see it there? Faith, hope, and love? If Paul... Paul will weave that into a number of his epistles. Of course, you really see it in, you know, 1 Corinthians 13. But he says here, your faith in Christ Jesus. Faith is an upward thing. Love, agape love. For the believer, it's an outward thing. You know, faith is upward. We look to him. For many people, and, and you know, 
more and more, the longer I've been a pastor, the more I realize that I don't have a pet peeve or a couple of pet peeves. I've realized I've got a whole wagon full of pet peeves. But um, one of my pet peeves, I'll just let you know that just because I feel like, you know, I should, full disclosure, um, is this silly language that our society uses and that sadly the church has adopted. Faith-based organizations. What the heck is a faith-based organization? Everybody's faith-based. Everybody is faith-based. Even the atheist is faith-based. So what's a faith-based organization? Oh, you're a person of faith. Like that's something glorious. What's a person of faith? Muslims are people of faith. Hindus are people of faith. Buddhists are people of faith. And, and who knows what? But, but and, and, and so all kinds of people are people of faith. Faith has to have an object. Faith has to have an object. Faith is rooted in the word to believe, okay? So, and to count on, that's the idea. He says, your faith. Where is your faith? Faith has to have an object. My faith is upward. It's in Jesus Christ who's seated at the right hand of the throne of the Father. That's where my faith is. My faith is in him. It was too often, and we've seen that in you know, error that comes into the church, this idea of, of um, uh, you know, faith in faith, that you, that you must really believe, and if something doesn't happen the way you wanted it to, or healing doesn't come in your life, or you feel that a prayer is not answered, it's because you didn't have enough faith. Silliness. It's, 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 it's not just silliness. It's absolute... It's, it's actually a form of spiritual terrorism that, that people use sometimes. It's a weapon that people use against other people. Faith has to have an object. Faith in Jesus Christ. Faith is upward. But as a result of that, then, then his agape love works through us. Now, you know, we can all squelch his desire to love others. But love is horizontal. Love, love is toward others. So there's faith is upward. Love is outward and and hope is forward it's looking forward to you know the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our lord jesus christ we're we're looking forward we're moving ahead that's the idea we want to continue to move ahead because we know that one day we will see him face to face and we don't want to be ashamed at his appearing when he comes for us he says so we heard of your faith in christ jesus and your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you've heard before in the word the truth of the gospel which has come to you as it has also come in all the world and is bringing forth fruit. The gospel is bringing forth fruit. What kind of fruit is the gospel bringing forth? What kind of fruit does the gospel bring? What kind of fruit does the gospel bring? Believers. Believers. That's the idea. You know, Jesus says, if you abide in me and my word abides in me, you, you can ask for anything you will, and it will be done for you because the desires that are on our hearts will be his desires. And you will bear much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. The primary fruit is as much as we talk about, you know, Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit, you know, which is love that manifests itself in all these different ways. But the primary fruit is other people who come from darkness to light, who come from death to life because they see God at work in us, Christ at work in us. And so he says, um, it's, it's bringing forth much fruit as it is also uh, among you since the day you heard and you knew the grace of God and truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. He says there's great stuff that's, that's going on here. God's desire, and you know, it, we, we live at a time, I'm going to be careful I say this because I don't want to take up a lot of time, but, but sometimes as believers, we can look at the rest of the world and think that the rest of the world are ostriches with their head in the dirt stick their head in a hole in the ground and just hope that you know the bad stuff passes by. The sad thing about that is that we don't realize that we're really talking about ourselves a lot of times. 
very often as believers, we're the ones who are sticking our head in the dirt and ignoring what's going on in our own society. Or we can, you know, we'll badmouth the politicians or something like that, but we, we ignore the reality. And, you know, there's stuff that's going on right now in our society, there's stuff that's going on in Washington right now. You know, and people, we could get it, I could start a debate real quick in here just talking about, you know, the debt ceiling and what's been going on for the last, whatever it's been now, two and a half weeks. But we are facing the decline of the American culture. And Americans don't never want to hear that. We never want to hear that. But we are facing it. We're in the midst of the decline of the American culture. We're in the midst of the decline of the American currency. We're in the midst of the decline of um, the American way and, and all these things. And, and it's been engineered. And that's, yeah, OK, that's an opinion. But it, it's hard to explain that it's anything other than that. It's happening all around us. And, and we're the only ones who have the words of life. We're the only ones who have the words of life. That does not mean that when hard times come, we shouldn't be prepared. If anybody should be prepared, it ought to be the believer. In early November, we're probably going to have another prophecy night. We're going to focus this one more on being prepared, materially prepared. I'm not talking about how many guns a person has. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> See, that's what everybody always thinks. That's a whole separate issue. But having food, having water, having a way to be warm, those kinds of things, so that, sure, we want to be able to, to take care of our families and not become victims, but at the same time, what an incredible opportunity and outreach, an opportunity to bring the gospel to the unsaved who never saw any of this coming. So we need to do that. And as a church, we believe as leadership that it's our responsibility to begin to, to talk about that and, and not be like chicken little, but at the same time to be realistic about what's happening. So, yeah, there was a jumping off point for me there. Um, there always is a jumping off point for me. But in any event, what, what we fail to realize sometimes, oh, I know, we, we can, it happened once to me in 86, it took me a number of years to get back. And, but, but what we fail to realize sometimes is that what we're doing is we're sticking our head in the sand and, and we'll, we'll use language about, you know, how the world's going, you know, in a handbasket, and, um, and, and it's only us. God preserves a remnant, and he wants the remnant to do something. If we're the remnant, we're to be active. We're to, we're to be taking action. We're to be light in the society. And it's not God's desire. Peter says it, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it's not God's desire that any would perish, any would perish, but rather that all would come to salvation. Now, that doesn't mean that all will come to salvation, but that is God's desire. So in the midst of hard times, God is handing us on a silver platter an incredible opportunity, not for the pastors and the missionaries, but for every believer, an incredible opportunity to be real with the truth. Not bombastic, just real with the truth to show love and to invite people to know Jesus Christ. He gives us that opportunity in much the same way as hearts are open and at, at a funeral. You know, and, and it's, it's one of the few times in our, anymore in our society where people's hearts are open and they'll actually listen to you tell them about Jesus Christ. The same thing's going to happen when the lights go off. And suddenly you wake up and you find out that the currency doesn't work. And, and people will be open. They'll also be angry. But, but they'll be open to listen because they want to understand what's going on. It's not God's desire that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. So he says, you've done this and you've been faithful to do this. Verse 9, he says, for this reason we also, since the day that we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask a number of things. There are some specific prayer requests that Paul has here, and he tells them what he, what he prays for them about. He says, we, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask, first of all, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now, he's actually, there's some punny stuff going on here, okay? He's being a punny guy because knowledge was the key word that the Gnostics were using. Remember, Gnostics, Gnosis, knowledge, okay? So he's saying, we want you to be filled with all knowledge, the truth, okay? 
Uh, he says, so the, the first part of the prayer is that you would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's what the, the Gnostics were doing. They were saying, look, we have the information. We have the knowledge. You want wisdom? It's great that you've heard about this Jesus. It's great that you've, that you've trusted in what in a lot of times today people would call the Christ's spirit. Okay, that's a bogus idea. But anyhow, they, they say that. But real wisdom, we can offer you real wisdom. Listen to this. He says, no, it's our prayer that you would be filled with the truth, knowledge, and that you would understand his will. You would understand God's will uh, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. How do you know God's will? That's, that, that, you know, one of the most frequently asked questions that, that Christians have. It's one of the most frequently asked questions that I hear, that counselors hear. How do I know God's will? And most of us are asking about his vocational will. What should I do next? You know, should, should I get married? Should I go into the military? Should I go to college? Should I take that job or that job? You know, how do I know God's will? When God's will is that we be sanctified. God's will is that we be increasingly, you know, or continually rather, um, transformed. That we would be renewed in our minds. And he says that in Romans chapter 12, that we not be conformed, pressed into the, the, the shape of the mold of this world, but that we be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may know God's good and perfect will. We know God's good and perfect will as we're transformed. How are we transformed? By his spirit and his word. That has to do with us, not by going to church, that's part of it, we worship together as saints, we learn the word, but it's individually, privately, personally, with the Lord saying, I am here, my heart is open, my Bible's open, speak to me. And then we need to listen when we say, speak to me. And it's good to take notes. I mean, you know, like if we go to college, if you go to high school, what do they say in high school? Take notes. You're supposed to take notes. If we take notes from a high school teacher or a junior high teacher or a college prof, why would we not take notes when the God of the universe speaks? Think about that for a second. Process that. People say, well, I'm not a journaler. Don't be a journaler. Go take notes. You don't call it a journal. You'll feel a lot better. Because <laughs> most people who say I don't journal are men who think that's a girl thing to do. Okay, don't call it a journal. Don't call it a diary. Just keep notes in a book. Because if God is speaking to you, you want to remember what he says. And if you got a mind, I hope you don't have a mind like mine, because it, it kind of like goes in here and pours out the other side sometimes. So it's good to trap it somewhere so that you can go back and refer to it. And sometimes when we're really down, it's good to go back and look at those things that God has said to us uh, in previous months or over the years. How do we know God's will? I can't tell you what job to take. I can't tell you who to marry, who not to marry. People come to me like I'm supposed to have that information. And come to counselors like counselors are supposed to have that information. We don't have that information. God knows that direction. So we go to him. And what people often do is make the mistake of thinking, okay, well then I'm just going to go to God and I'm just going to ask and I'm going to wait. Well, then you may as well just sit in the full lotus position and open up your palms and, you know, because it's the same thing at that point. No, it's, it's not a matter of just waiting. It's a matter of Spending time in his word, and as we do that, and as we're transformed by the renewing of our minds, then we will know. It's sequential. If you read through this, the, those two verses, chapter 12 of Romans, verses 1 and 2, it's sequential. Then we'll know God's good and perfect will. He says, but that's our prayer, that you would do that, and to, that you may walk worthy of of the Lord. This is, a, this is a theme that continues to come up. We saw it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, that we would walk worthy of the calling to which we've been called. He said it in uh, Philippians. We just saw it a couple of months ago. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Here he's saying it again that you may walk worthy of the Lord. In other words, live the word. Live what God has shown us. And walk in a way that's worthy is the idea of equivalent to. Walk equivalent to what God has done in our lives. So that we don't end up making the mistake 
Because most of us don't move into this error in our Christian life by saying, I plan to just take this Jesus thing and put it over in this two-hour slot every week, and the other 166 hours, I'll just do what I want to. We don't. It's the rare person who actually thinks about that. We end up doing that through neglect. And so he says, choose. It's our prayer that you would choose to live a life worthy of the gospel, live a life worthy of this calling on, on your life, worthy of the Lord that would be fully pleasing to him. How, how can we live a life that's fully pleasing to God? What, what would that look like? It means, and it doesn't mean that, that we walk around and we never smile and we look like we're sucking on lemons, and that's not the idea. Or that, you know, we're always, you know, mm, you know and we came out of, you know, no, I, we're not supposed to look like monks. That's not, and, and a lot of Christians actually think sometimes it's almost like a monastic lifestyle and we just avoid everything that has to do with, with the world. Jesus was a friend of sinners. They loved being with him. And yet he never, he never ceased to be exactly who he was. He had an irresistible personality because he loved them. And so there's to be his love flowing through us, and that's a life that's pleasing to the Lord. And a life that's pleasing to the Lord is a life that desires to know him better. A life that's pleasing to the Lord is a life that desires to understand his word better. A life that's pleasing to the Lord is a life that chooses to put the past behind and move forward into what he has for us. That's, those are pieces of this idea of a life that's pleasing to the Lord. He says, that's one of our prayers for you that you would be fruitful in every good work as you put your hand to it, that there would be fruit that would be born and, and that you would be increasing in the knowledge of God and that you would be strengthened with all might. What is that? All, all means all, right? That you would be strengthened with all might. Where does might, what is might? It's power. Where does power come from? It's either going to come from your flesh, which is going to dwindle really quickly, or it's going to come from his spirit, that you would be strengthened by his spirit. That's what he's saying, that you would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering, with joy. Now, we never want to do the joy thing because some people don't make us happy, and sometimes we'd rather not do the joy thing. But no, that's exactly what he wants because that's who God is. That's his personality, so that we would be strengthened with all might and that we would have patience, long suffering but that we would be that with joy. And think of some of the people who try you the most. And he's saying that we would have joy in our patience with them. I know it sounds absolutely out of this world. It is. Because it's not something our flesh wants to do. It's not something our flesh can do. And, 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 but that's his desire. That's the, Paul's praying according to God's desire that you would be, verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. I have no qualification in and of myself. There's no, I'm not qualified for heaven. I'm not qualified to, to, have, to, to inherit anything. From God, but Jesus has qualified me. And it's not because of anything I've done, it's because of who I am in Christ, and it's who you are in Christ. You're qualified to be an heir. You're qualified already. And he wants us to walk on in that. He says, verse 13, because he has delivered us from the power of darkness. We don't need to dwell on who we used to be, but sometimes it's good to remember a few things, to remember where we were, sometimes to remember how much it hurt, or to remember the heartache, or to remember the sense of bondage, or whatever it was, and to realize afresh that we've been freed from that. We've been freed from that. We're no longer in darkness, but we're part of the saints. We're in light. We're in the light. We're in his light. And that he's delivered us from that, and he's conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. And we haven't seen the fullness of the kingdom yet, but only a peace. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. Well, you know, there is that, it's a term that uh, theologians use, already not yet. Oh, that makes a lot of sense, right? But already not yet. The kingdom of God for the believer is already not yet. What does that mean? It means that 
His spirit indwells us, and so we have the sense of, of God's desires and, 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 and how he is operating, what he wants to do through our lives. That's the already. That's, that's the piece of the kingdom that we can begin to taste. That's the already. The not yet is the fullness when the lion lays down with the lamb and there's peace and it beats our swords into plowshares and study war no more, all those things. That's the not yet part. But we have the already. Already. You know what I mean. Um, He's delivered us from the power of darkness. He's conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins. He says that he, Jesus, we'll just go quickly over this. We'll come back to it next week. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. He's the image, he's the, everything you see in him is the, is the what you can see of the God who is invisible. God is invisible. Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Father is spirit. You can't see him. He's, he's everywhere all at once. Jesus is the visible representation of, of God, and even to say representation is is like to degrade who he is. He's the, he's the visible part of God. Uh, he says to Philip, uh, John chapter 14, Philip says, Lord, just show us the Father, that'll be enough. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you, Philip, and still you don't know me? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. You can't see the Father, but you can see me. Even when we go through passages in the Old Testament, and because we, we, you know, we, we understand there's there's... There are these passages that say no one can look at the face of God and live, right? And yet there, there are times where people do see him. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. In the year the king of Zion died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, you know, and the seraphim were flying. And, and he sees the Lord. But if you look closely, remember L-O-R-D, all caps, is the divine name of God, and then there's capital L, lowercase O-R-D. He says, I saw the capital L, lowercase O-R-D. That's who I saw. Who's he seeing? He's seeing Jesus on the throne. And, and, and I'm not going to go through, but, but you can start to go through a lot of that in the Old Testament. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The Father's a spirit. He's everywhere. You can't see him, but you can see me. He's the image of the invisible God. In fact, he, he says back in um, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was, now the English word is word. In the beginning was the word, or logos is the Greek word. And, and, and we always have trouble trying to understand what logos means, people have all kinds of ideas, but um, some people say logos in, in Koine Greek was like, you know, the force. Uh, that's, a, that's a little too Star Warsy, but that's okay. I mean, it kind of works in some ways. Um, but the idea is that he was. So in the beginning was it gets translated as the word. What is a word? A word, something that we speak from our lips, is, is an idea that starts in the mind. And then the brain tells a series of muscles how to form this idea into, into a package that comes from a tongue to an ear, into the other person's mind. So it, it relates a concept. So a word is a representation of a concept. So in the beginning was the word, and he was with God, and he was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. By who? By the word. By the logos. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. He made everything. So we read Genesis chapter 1, and when we read in the beginning, same, same idea, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But John is telling us, yes, God did. But the means by which he did that was through this one who we come to know of as Jesus, the Son of God, the, the, the visible part of God, the Son. And, and so, so Paul is saying here that he's the image of the invisible God. Um, 
that he's the, um, now the firstborn thing, I guess the Jehovah's Witnesses all hot and bothered and they get all excited. They see, he is born into this world. That's not what it means, the idea, but it gets translated that. He's the firstborn, it says, over all creation. Prototokos is the Greek word, and it, and it means it speaks of preeminence. Um, so he uh, speaks of uh, supremacy, whether in time or in rank. So he's the, he's the first. He's, he's numero uno, we would call him. It's not speaking of his, of his physical creation because he has no creation. The Son of God was never created. He always has been. He's co-equal with the Father and with the, with the Holy Spirit. But he's the firstborn over all creation. By him, all things were created. By him, by Jesus Christ, all things were created, everything. By him, all things were created, things that are in heaven and things that are on earth. Think of the things that are in heaven. What are, what's in heaven? I mean, there's, there's, there are angels, right? There's, there's thrones, there's dominions. He's going to talk about those. But there's also, I mean, he says, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So he, he's the one who makes it all. You say, I don't get that. But you know what, honestly, neither do I. I'm just communicating to you what the Bible says. He, we always have to remember, he's God and we're not. And there's language here sometimes that's a lot higher than we are. But by him, all things are created. Things that are in heaven and things that are on the earth. Things that are visible, that we can figure out, because we can see the visible, and things that are invisible. That means... All the forces, gravity, the laws of electromagnetism, all of that stuff, he created all of that. He, he determines all of that, but he also created all of the spirit realm. He created all of the angels. It says that the things that are visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And we did a lot of this about a year ago when we did our study on the things unseen. All things were created through him, or by him, your Bible may say. All things were created through him, and this is amazing to me, and for him. Why were things created? They were created for him. Why are you here? Not in this room. Why are you walking on this ball of dirt? For him. We're here for him. And, 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 59 years, I thought it was for me. But we're here for him. He created all things for himself because he's the only one who gets the glory out of this. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, or by him, all things consist, or the ideas consist or hold together. I mean, it's an amazing thing when you start to think of an atom and you have a you have protons in the middle. They have a positive charge. And you have electrons that are spinning around, you know, in these orbits around. Well, we've all played with magnets. So that was, you know, when I was a kid, we had real toys. <laughs> you know, and we didn't, we didn't have video games, things like that. We had real toys. And um, play with magnets and other things. We played outside. We weren't always inside like these kids are nowadays. Do nothings, you know, and locked into some video screen somewhere and living at home until they're 35 and can't, can't find a girl to marry because she doesn't want to marry a guy who's glued to a video screen. Anyhow, I just, you know. so we played with real toys and, and magnets. Think of magnets, right? It, man, you could, you could take that, the, the, the negative end and the positive end and they would, oh, they just went together, especially if you had, oh, it was cool to have strong magnets, you know, or if you, you know, if you had, oh, we, oh man, we, no time, but man, we created like electromagnets sometimes. That was really cool because they were strong, you know, and you take the, the, the opposite ends and man, they just stuck together. You have to pull them apart, you know, but you try to take the two positive ends, the two negative ends, you know, and try to push them together. And, oh, because you couldn't get them together. Protons, positive charge. 
multiple protons in, in the center of the, of, of, of the atom, and they hold together. Fascinating. For years, the concept was atomic glue. And then they realized there's no atomic glue. It's super glue. But, um, but no, no one could figure out. Now we're into string theory and all this stuff about what holds things together. No one gets it, really. They just know that it is. And, and why are these electrons spinning around out there? Why don't they just all, boom, come together? Because, you know, negative and positive should do this. That's why we have atomic bombs, right? Now you take, what, what, plutonium is what, 62 protons or something? I forget what the number is. But, you know, you take, you take a plutonium atom with that many protons and you put enough force against it and you, you smash those, those protons so that they, wanna, that they have to fly apart. The power that's released is incredible. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. By him, all things hold together. That's what the Bible says. In fact, I'll end with this. But this is, this is what it says. It says in Peter that you know, God's not desiring that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. That's the big bang, okay? That's the big bang. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. Now think about it, I mean, if you just if take one atom, and, and, and if it takes that much force to, to take one atom or a number of, of plutonium atoms and, and smash them to create that much, you know, uh, uh, destructive force, think of, just what holds your body together. All these atoms. And he holds it all together. And we think, you know, we're holding it together. No, we don't hold anything together. All we do is kind of move it around a little bit, you know. We can color it, we can comb it, we can do those things, but we don't hold anything together. We feel sometimes like, I'm, everything's falling apart in my life. No, he holds it together. Let him hold it together. I understand the feeling. I'm just saying, it, he's the one who holds it together. He's the one who holds. So if, if the, the, all, that, all that power holds an atom together, all that power just holds one individual person's body together or seven billion person's bodies together and the whole planet together, let alone an entire solar system and the galaxy and the galaxies and, and all of that. And then one day, the father says, that's enough. And he lets go. And that's the great noise we're talking about. He says, with a, they will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. You betcha. You betcha. That's global warming. So see, it's a whole new definition for Big Bang and global warming. Both the earth and all of its works that are in it will be burned up. Seeing, he says, that all these things will be destroyed in this way what type of people ought you to be? That's the question, isn't it? That's the pregnant question. Let's stand together. Father, you have given us your word and you've given us, Lord, so much. We thank you for your love for us and we thank you for your, we call it patience because that's the way we see it, Lord. And, and I know it is patience, but it's, it's eternal patience. Thank you for what you've done in our lives. Thank you for what you've given to us in Christ. Thank you for this great salvation, Lord. Lord, if there's anyone here who doesn't know you, may their heart just be burning to want to know you, to want to put the past behind for good, to have this great salvation, to come from the darkness into the light. For anyone here, Lord, as a believer, who's living in compromise, messing around. We see what's happening in our world, Lord, and we see the days growing short. And we don't want to be ashamed at your appearing. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you teach us, Lord. Transform our lives, Lord. We yield ourselves to you. Be with us, Lord, in our fellowship as we speak to one another after this. We thank you, Lord, for all you've done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.